Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. The Lord Jesus told us, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Anybody waiting for you in the office tomorrow that fits that description? Anybody in your home? Anybody in your neighborhood? If he can do them good, even when they do him evil, so can you and I. Most people like to think that deep down they're essentially good. So when it comes to doing God's work, they have a lot to offer. But we flatter ourselves by thinking God will accept us based on our own merit. Today on a special Encore edition of Know the Truth, Philip de Corsi takes us deep into the text of 1 Thessalonians. We'll gain a better understanding of the true relationship between God, humans, and the biblical basis for salvation as we revisit a popular message titled, The Real Deal. Well, I invite you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. When you and I give the reins of our life to Jesus Christ, He breaks the cycle of disobedience. Or to borrow the words of Wesley, He breaks the power of cancel sin, causing us to walk in newness of life. Christianity is transformative. Now, with that in mind... The idea of the transforming power of the gospel, we come in to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 2 through 10, because the transforming power of the gospel forms the very backdrop of the passage we are now going to consider. This passage outlines for us the transformative tremors that are felt across a life touched by the grace of God. What we have here is the evidential signs of a man or a woman who truly belongs to God and truly believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a model church set before us and model Christians set before us. If you want to break the passage down, I think there are five marks that I see here. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this outline down. In verses 2 and 3, we see that they are an excellent church, verses 2 through 3. They are an elect church, verses 4 through 5. They are an exemplary church, verses 6 through 7. They are an evangelistic church, verses 8 through 9. And they are an expectant church, verses 10. Of the five things, I want to make a start on one. It was an excellent church. It was an excellent church. This is verses 2 and 3. This was a church that sparkled with spiritual life and glistened with Christian virtues of faith, love, and hope, of which love is the greatest, right? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. In fact, that's why I've called this section of the passage, it was an excellent church, because Paul, in speaking of love to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, says, look, I show you a more excellent way. The most excellent way of living your Christian life is rooting everything you do in love. Faith, hope, and love. Love being the greatest. So Paul gives thanks for these graces that are to be found in this church. By the way, the word thanks here comes from a root Greek word, eucharisto, which means grace. We have an English word that comes from the Greek, Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. And so what we have here in Paul's thanksgiving is for the evidences of grace that was to be found in these believers at Thessalonica. The evidence of grace in their faith that serves, in their love that labors, in their hope that perseveres. Paul was declaring thanks to God every day for the evident transformation in the life of the Christians here. And what's interesting is the link between gratitude and joy and grace. Listen to these words from Ben Patterson in his book, He Has Made Me Glad. 
Gratitude and joy are twin children of grace, organically joined both theologically and spiritually. In Greek, they are even related linguistically. The words for grace, gratitude, and joy all have the same root, car, a noun that refers to health and well-being. The word grace is the Greek word karos. The word gratitude is the Greek word eucharistio. And the third word joy is kara. All those words are linked together. Grace, joy, thanksgiving. And he says this, grace and gratitude belong together like heaven and earth. Grace evokes gratitude like the voice of an echo. Gratitude follows grace like thunder and lightning. When we see the grace of God in another person's life, it should provoke thanksgiving. It did for Paul. And when you and I receive the grace of God from someone else's life, when they minister to us in kindness, in forgiveness, we should also be provoked to give thanks to God. The grace of God in us, the grace of God in others, and the grace of God between us is something you should cause us to give thanks to God. We don't want to be like the woman who was leaving the church one morning and told her pastor that the sermon was good and thanked them for it. The pastor, in a self-effacing manner, said, don't thank me, thank the Lord, to which the woman replied, it wasn't that good. My friend, when God ministers to you through another, when the grace of God is evidently at work among us, it's good. It ought to be that which sparks our thanksgiving. So let's look at this trinity of graces that follow in a natural order here. Faith, love, hope. One rests on the past, one works in the present, and one looks to the future. First there comes faith, which is the source of all Christian experience. Then there comes love, which is the governing principle of all Christian behavior. And finally there comes hope, which is the beacon which guides us to the life to come. Faith is upward, love is outward, hope is forward. Now let's look at the first Christian virtue here that marks this excellent church. We see a faith that functions. Paul acknowledges their faith, doesn't he? He gives thanks to God for their work of faith. He's speaking about any activity related to Christian service that is inspired by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking about dedicated deeds that spring from faith in the Savior. Now listen, John Calvin got it right when he said, We're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. When you and I think of faith, when you and I think of our dependent trust in God and the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to see that there are two sides to faith in Christ. On the one hand, there is the passive side of faith. That's faith resting in what Jesus did. Let's go to Ephesians 2 and show you this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Very familiar words, but worth reading again. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is faith resting. This is our dependence in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did on the cross for us. Paul explains that back in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, where we read, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. This is faith resting. There comes a point when you and I give up on ourselves, give up on our self-righteousness, give up on working our way to heaven, 
trying to climb to heaven by means of your good works is like trying to climb, said George Whitfield, on a rope of sand. It doesn't work. God has done that work for us in Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sin. That word carries the idea of satisfaction. Jesus Christ became the sheath for the sword of God's justice. That's faith resting. That's the passive side. But once you and I have put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that brings us into union with Jesus Christ. Just as a branch is in a vine, it will produce fruit. So the life that is now connected to Jesus Christ by faith will produce works inspired by faith. Isn't that what Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 10? Having said that we are saved through faith alone, in Christ alone, as a matter of the gift of God, he then goes on to say, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. This is the other side of faith. This is the active side of faith. And this is what we're dealing with here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the active side of faith. There came that moment when they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and turned from idols to serve the true and the living God. That was their conversion. And it issued a a life-changing experience that produced certain works inspired by faith. I hope that's what's going on in your life. You know what? Don't be falling prey to the idea of being a card-carrying Christian. Well, you can pull out a card of the day and the hour you walked some mile or heard some message. That's great, and that may be the start. But you know what? I hope that there's faith that's a living. This is James' issue. This is James' fear. He said, you know, there's some people who profess faith, but it's a dead faith. Just as a body can live without a spirit, faith doesn't exist without works. You can't say you're a Christian and you have faith in Jesus Christ if you can't point to an increasing transformative aspect of your walk with God. Because James says even the devils believe, and they're hardly saved, are they? Faith was never a mere idle thing to the church at Thessalonica. Faith was to them a warm personal trust in the living Christ who has come to live in them and labor through them. What does Paul say in Galatians 2.20? The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Faith in Christ colored everything that they were and everything that they did. And I think that's the challenge here as Paul marks out those who are truly elect, those that are the real deal, those that are the wheat and not the tares, those that show signs, evidential signs of true conversion, they will exhibit a life where faith functions on a day-to-day basis. Their faith shapes their marriage. Their faith shapes their child rearing. Their faith shapes what they do with money. Their faith shapes their sexual morality, so on and so forth. Their life bears the fruit of the image of God and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, don't say you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't show works towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith cannot exist without works any more than a body can live without the Spirit or steam exists without water or there be a desert without sand. One is the root and the other is the fruit. They are a combo platter. They belong together. They are inseparable. We are not saved by works. We are saved unto works. We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Let's look at the second virtue. Whenever we have a faith that functions, secondly, we have a love that labors. A love that labors. The Thessalonians were also marked by an abounding and resounding love for each other. We give thanks to God always for you all, mentioning you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work prompted by faith and your labor prompted by love. That's how you could read that. This is the second mark of the elect of God and those who are truly saved. 
In fact, if you go over to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, the book next to 1 Thessalonians, what do we read? Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35? By this, they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. So when Paul hears that this church is head over heels in love with the Lord Jesus, and they are showing that love to one another, he concludes they are the elect of God. God's at work here. This is a work of the Spirit. There are evidential signs that this is a true church made up of true Christians. The life that is being touched by the love of God in Christ will undoubtedly touch others with the love of God through Christ. We read in 1 John 3 and verse 14, that's the case. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you, For we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. The Lord Jesus told us that we will not only love the brothers and sisters that make up the family of God, God will give us enough grace to even love our enemies. That's going to be another evidential sign of God's work in our life. Over in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, we read these words of the Lord Jesus. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Anybody waiting for you in the office tomorrow that fits that description? Anybody in your home? Anybody in your neighborhood? What are you going to do with them? Well, hopefully you're not going to go home and stick a pen in a little doll, all right? (laughs) Hopefully you're going to go home and pray for the grace that God can give to his people that Jesus talks of here, where you will love your enemy and bless them, that you, verse 45, may be the sons of your father who makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God loves his enemies enough to let those today who are at their homes not giving one thought to the Lord Jesus, they're still going to enjoy this day. It's sunshine. It's blessings. Why? Because that's what our father's like. And if he can love them, and if he can be patient with them, and if he can do them good, even when they do him evil, so can you and I. That's what Christians do. That's the mark of the true believer. Let me tell you a story. It relates to a man I met a few years ago at a shepherd's conference at Grace Community Church. His name was Aidan McKenzie. He was a brother from Tennessee. He had lived for some years in Australia, but he healed from the old country, Ireland itself. You see, he was from the south of Ireland, and he was a Catholic. I was from the north of Ireland, and I was a Protestant. Before he was converted, he was a supporter of the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, the terrorist group that was trying to sever the link between Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom. Before I was saved, I was an RUC officer trying to kill the IRA in Northern Ireland. At another time and another place, we would have killed each other, or at least tried but I brought him home, gave June a call, told her to have some dinner ready. And as we drove into our garage at the time, we were living in a little apartment. I forgot that I had on my wall a big Union Jack, a big British flag. <laughs> he hadn't looked at me. And then he laughed. He said, you know what? There would have been a day when I would have torn the throat out of you because of that. And then he said these unforgettable words looking at that flag, looking at me, a Protestant from Northern Ireland, an XRUC officer. He said, now I know I'm saved. (laughs) Now I know I'm saved. Saved by the love of God. Subdued by the love of Christ. That's the way we ought to live this week. In the midst of a world that will hate us, In the midst of a culture that's increasingly hostile to things righteous and to things Christian, 
But we are people saved by the love of God, subdued by the love of God, and in showing that to those who despitefully use us, we will know that we're saved, and God will use it to bring others to salvation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we want to rip up the game plan that any of us might have. We want to come with a fresh piece of paper. We want to write down, Lord, the game plan that we see unfolding here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Lord, we see a glorious specimen of classic Christianity. Lord, this is what we want to be like. This is what needs to mark our ministry. Lord, we pray that we would be people who are grateful for the signs of God's grace in our life and the lives of others. Lord, we pray that our profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, that indeed our conduct would match our creed, that indeed when people come here, they would see acts of service prompted by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would see our faith tomorrow and the day after that, that they would see work prompted by belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and the way we order our homes and build our marriages, the way we conduct our affairs and, uh, Lord, transact our financial dealings. Lord, we don't want it to be the case of a dead faith, a spurious faith, a false faith. Lord, prompt greater change in all of us by faith. May we love one another the way you have loved us. May we look beyond the ugliness, the things that we feel to do, and may we, Lord, seek to bless those that curse us. May we seek to forgive those that have offended us. May we in all our dealings deal lovingly. Lord, lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Learning to accept the love and the grace of God. That's a lifelong struggle for many of us. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Today's message is called The Real Deal. It's part of our series called Classic Christianity, and we're revisiting it today on this special encore edition of Know the Truth. But remember, you can always revisit any message on our website, ktt.org, or by downloading the KTT app. It's a joy to bring you clear, convicting Bible teaching every day. But you know, it's not enough just to hear the Word preached. We need to read it for ourselves. Personal time in God's Word is crucial for our spiritual health. But if we're honest, reading our Bibles can sometimes feel intimidating, can it? Perhaps you're unsure where to start or you struggle to stay focused. Whatever the case, we have a book that we think will be of great help. It's titled, How to Eat Your Bible. Author Nate Pickowitz helps you overcome these barriers and cultivate an appetite for God's Word. We'd love to send you a copy of this powerful book as our way of saying thanks for your generous financial support of this program. To give and request the book, call 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. Know the Truth is funded by listeners like you, Whether you can give $25, $50, $100, your donations make a lasting impact, helping more people hear God's Word taught and applied properly. So, on behalf of everyone listening, thank you. Again, here's how to get in touch. Call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us again next week when we'll begin a brand new series that Philip recently preached. It's called Be Encouraged, and it's sure to be uplifting and refreshing after a difficult year. So don't miss next week, right here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.